I'm very excited to have uh, Kwok Le here visiting us today from uh, Stanford and Google. Um, I've tracked Kwok's work since he was an undergraduate at uh, Australian National University where he was working with Alex Mola and did some really influential work on kernel methods then. And uh, when he was applying for graduate schools, he got offers everywhere and I was hoping he would work with me, but then he went on and did some uh, really interesting work on um, Deep Leaf Networks and worked with uh, Andrew Ng and our own Jeff Dean at Google. And he's been uh, showing how to scale these kinds of models to really, really big problems and getting a ton of press. So I'm very excited to, to learn about that today. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos, for the uh, kind words. I will go, uh, go over a few things that I'm excited about. To begin, I want to say thank you to a lot of uh, uh, friends and colleagues at uh, both Google and Stanford. Uh, and in, in particular, I want to highlight the contribution of uh, Jeff Dean, uh, my advisor Andrew Ng, and uh, Alex Mola. And um, Jeff Dean is, used to be a grad student here. Uh, so I came from the Bay Area uh, in the Silicon Valley, and uh, machine learning becomes uh, a very uh, important part of in many companies, so it's doing very well. And uh, over the years, we have a lot of success stories. Um, you know, here are some uh, great examples. But this is only the beginning because there are still a lot of other applications in machine learning that we still want more powerful technologies uh, to drive it. And um, um, it uh, started many years ago uh, when I was an undergrad. I, I had a vision that you know, one day, uh, that what, one important direction for computer science is actually uh, artificial intelligence. And then we're going to go to the point that we, we eventually have to solve artificial intelligence. So because of that, and I thought, you know, machine learning is actually a, a very interesting direction in that uh, uh, in, uh, an interesting angle, because we can, from data to knowledge representation is actually an interesting way. So I, look, uh, I work with Alex Mola on a variety of topics in uh, kernel methods, using kernel methods to learn um, uh, knowledge from data. But towards the end of my undergrad, I looked into perception problems, uh, robotics and computer vision. And the reason why I look at, uh, into um, computer vision uh, is because computer vision back at the time was uh, very hard and it's still very hard now. And for, for uh, um, an example here, um, the case that I want to run an object uh, detection to find me marks uh, in a picture. So I want to, if I want to uh, build a, house, a household robot to detect, to find me, uh, fetch me uh, mugs, then if I implement the, the best technology at the time in computer vision, we end up you know, you know, with a bunch of detection for mugs, but we also end up with a few detection for um, uh, a lot of false detection here and there. Uh, so that's not great. Uh, so the reason why I study computer vision and perception problems in general is because, um, because of two main reasons. First is because uh, at the end of the day, computer vision and perception problems are very interesting problems to solve because they are they're valuable, are valuable, right? <coughs> Let's say if you want to build robots, uh, we can't avoid it. If you want to uh, understand the web, we can't avoid it. And the second reason I, I think about uh, perception problems is because uh, it's, a, uh, it's a domain that is, requires a lot of, um, uh, that the machine learning uh, hasn't uh, provided a very good solution yet. And, it may be uh, there's uh, something that we can learn from this domain to, uh, to actually uh, drive machine learning forward too. Uh, and uh, my investigation of um, uh, perception problems, like computer vision problems, lead me to uh, key challenges to, uh, that make perception very, very hard. So uh, I, I think in my opinion, uh, perception problems are hard because of two main reasons. So the first reason is actually feature de designing good features for, for, feature, uh, for uh, perception problems like computer vision, speech recognition is difficult. And the second challenge is uh, the, the scale of problems is, is, uh, is incredible. And uh, comp uh, computational uh, constraint that we have, uh, co the computation that we require to solve this problem is actually uh, is incredible. And those are the two parts that make um, perception problems really hard. So I, I want to walk through uh, these key challenges um, uh, step by step. 
So, so let's take a let's do a backup envelope calculation of uh, a small image problem. So let's say uh, I want to understand images of 100 by 100 pixel. Then uh, every image is represented by 10,000 dimensional vector. That is a very high dimensional vector. And here I'm talking about very small problems in computer vision, right? If we take about, talk about realistic images, that means the representation is even bigger. So to, in order to address the high dimensionality of the problem, people rely on, uh, uh, the brain actually relies on a lot of uh, factors, but one factor that we, uh, want, uh, we have to understand is that actually it uses a lot of computation and it uses a lot of data. And typically, by two years old, we see you know, one billion images. So that's, that's an incredible amount of images that go through the, pro uh, the vision, visual processing system. Um, uh, computer vision um, uh, uh, researchers have seen this. So at the beginning, uh, computer vision look at a data set which has you know, about 1,000 images and so on. But uh, a lot of things don't turn out to work very well. So uh, they start scaling up. Uh, and among many things that they tried, it turns out that scaling up the data set seemed to help a lot. So they keep increasing the amount of data that, uh, you know, from uh, UICUC, which is 1,000 uh, images, to Caltech, about 3,000, and then Caltech 255, 3,000, and et cetera. And then uh, now we have the ImageNet data set that has 14 million images. Right? And because the reason why we go with, with such a speed of uh, data and the size of the data set is because among many things that we try, the data doesn't help machine learning, and people want to use more data to uh, solve per perception problems. So if, if you look at uh, ImageNet, that this is seemed to be like a very, um, um, very big attempt in computer vision, but if you look at the size of data set that we normally see, which is a billion image, and the size of the data set uh, that available on the web, then that is very small. For example, the size of uh, ImageNet is now a plot in, uh, you know, in comparison to the size of the images uh, on the web. Then this is a very, very small fraction uh, compared to this. Now, uh, so, um, and, and my view is that in order to actually uh, um, do perception problem very well, we have to actually scale our learning systems to address data set in here. Now, one interesting factor that uh, have pointed out by many people is that uh, even though we have a lot of images on the web, a lot of data on the web, a very small fraction of it is actually labeled data. So, for example, you don't have images that people say that's a car or that's a dog or that's a cat, etc. But a lot of people just say random images are everywhere, right? So the key uh, scientific question is how to use unlabeled data, right? And uh, we're going to use lots of unlabeled data right, right here, and then we also use a, a small fraction of the labeled data to solve our problem. So that's that's a key scientific question. So the approach that we have is going to be uh, in, the, in that um, uh, direction. Okay, so computation is one of the key challenges. So um, the second challenge is feature designing. So um, because com uh, uh, compu perception problems are so hard, people, and they are very high dimensional, people used to inject uh, prior knowledge into the system by using, uh, by designing their own features. And let's take computer vision as another example. So let's say we want to recognize faces in images. Then one thing that we could do is we say, let's, let's think about what distinguish uh, faces from non-faces. And we say, okay, maybe it's the shape of the face, or maybe the fact that there are eyes in the image, or, and so on. Or may, and then maybe one kind of feature that can capture that concept is the edge detector. So I will try to take raw data and represent it in a different space, so, uh, for example, in the edge detection. And then once I have the, the, the edges, I can run the classifier on top of it. So machine learning people, uh, the community, have worked on this area, the last stage of this pipeline, a long, long time. So we're very good at doing it. And what, is we, what we're not very good at is this feature extraction stage. Right? And right now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work, uh, manual work going into this area. And I think, um, um, 
And the problem with, with this approach is that if we have, um, it might work well for one problem, but if we have other problems, <laughs> like, um, uh, you know, speech recognition, or uh, instead of categorizing faces, or uh, we want to categorize chairs, for example, then this approach doesn't scale. So let me take uh, you through why um, designing features is so crucial. So let's, um, uh, so from a machine learning perspective, the cartoon picture looks like this. So the cartoon picture goes as, let's say we take raw feature representation, and then we map it into a vector in, uh, in the raw uh, representation. So what, what we tend to see is that images that have faces and images that don't have faces don't seem to be a cluster. So it's very hard to draw a boundary to separate the two concepts. But if we have good feature representation, then our data are gonna map into something uh, to the right. Maybe some edge feature would do. And then once we have data on that representation, it's very easy to draw a hyperplane to separate the two concepts. And this is, this is the important reason why people spend so much of their time to actually invent new features for perception problems. And, um, uh, and uh, this, this goes on into many areas. So in computer vision, we have um, SIFT and HAWK, which are the state-of-the-art features. And then in um, speech recognition, we have systems like MFCC uh, spectrogram. In information retrieval, we also have handcrafted features in, in NLPs and so on and so forth. So, um, and the reason why we, I call it hand-designed feature is that actually it requires human expert knowledge and domain knowledge of the problem to design the feature. And the, the, the weakness of that is that if, if you have other problems come along, you might not be able to use the same approach anymore. You have to redesign your features so it doesn't scale for a lot of problems. So, uh, be, because we realize that it's such an important component inside a, um, a machine learning system, uh, in the past five years, I've been working on this area, trying to um, create features uh, from data. So, this, the system that we're gonna see next are uh, able to learn features from unlabeled data. And so, before I came to grad school, people, uh, um, thought that machine learning is anything after the feature extraction stage. But my work, we're able to push machine learning as far as possible to the, to the raw feature representation. So, so what you're gonna see is that actually uh, the, uh, the feature extraction stage gonna be a part of machine learning too. So we're able to automate the, the task of inventing features. So that's a key idea. Okay, so um, in this talk, I will go through the two key challenges. So the first challenge is basically how to learn features from data, and the second is how to scale with a massive amount of data. So I'm gonna, uh, my work is basically, in the past five years is in, in these two components. So I'm gonna talk about feature learning first. So I'm gonna uh, describe ideas of how to use machines to learn, uh, and data to learn features from data. And then, once I, um, I done that, I'm gonna scale them up using a huge computer cluster. That's the idea. <laughs> so the, um, um, the feature learning approach that we have is um, basically based on the concept of um, reconstruction independent component analysis. So this is my work in uh, 2001, but it's actually inspired by a lot of ideas in sparse coding and neuroscience. So the idea is that give a, a large collection of images on the left, we call them natural images. We're gonna sample patches, for example, 10 by 10 patches. And then we're gonna, the, the algorithm is gonna, disco gonna discover a set of bases that look like, you know, from images, it's gonna learn ash detectors, such that and when you have a new image coming in, so there's, there's an image in that has this diagonal edge, it will be represented by a linear combination of a small fraction of the basis. So what happens is this image in here will be uh, 0 0.8 this basis, 0 0.3 this basis, and 0 0.5 that basis. So even though I learned 64 bases, the representation is gonna be three numbers, right? Which is, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0 
and port 5 at the corresponding basis. So instead of I representing my features in the raw feature representation, which has a lot of non-zero values, my representation going to be mostly zeros, which is 0 0.8 here in index of 36, <coughs> and 0 0.3 in index of 42, and 0 0.5 in, in, in the index of 63. So uh, why is that good? And the reason why it's good is that as long as I see a couple of index indices in the right index, for example, there and there, then I would say that my image has a diagonal edge. Right? Whereas if I look at this image, it's very, I have no chance to say whether there's a <coughs> diagonal edge or not. So my feature, represent, if I represent my data in my z space, which is you know, the coefficients here, then I would be able to confidence, uh, confidently and say that you know, there's an, a diagonal edge going that way. So the, the, a lot of uh, feature extraction ideas that we have is basically based on this concept. So I, I'm going to walk through. Um, so now, uh, right now, I'm just telling you the intuition of the algorithm. But the, uh, the uh, um, technicality of the algorithm, the, the implementation of the algorithm is actually very simple. So here's how it works. So you take your data xi. So xi is a in the form of a vector. Uh, and an image of 10 by 10 would be explained by a 100-dimensional long vector. And then uh, an i index uh, each example. And then you want to learn your parameter w, such that w transpose w times x can be able to reconstruct your data. So you want to learn some bases that are able to construct your input. And here, I can tell, you can see that all the information here that I need to train this algorithm is, um, doesn't require any labeling information. Right? And the, on, another component of the system is sparsity. So you want W time x to be sparse. Right? So basically, the system wants you to learn um, the parameters such that uh, when you do W time x, you can reconstruct uh, the, the, the original input, and w time x is sparse. And there is uh, some linear constant that, you know, trying to balance between the two concepts. And um, again, x is the input data, m is the number of examples, uh, lambda is the trade-off between the reconstruction and sparsity, w is the parameter matrix, um, uh, w can be a non-square matrix, so you can have more rows than columns. So you can end up with um, you have more features than the, the input if you want. Um, when, when you're done with your learning, you could say uh, the feature representation is w times x, and then take the absolute value, which is a nonlinear transform of the data. So uh, and um, oh, this is the basic algorithm that we use uh, later on in our work. Um, so, so this algorithm actually connect, well connected to a variety of algorithms inside uh, deep learning. So, if you are, are familiar with deep learning, uh, there's a lot of algorithms. For example, autoencoder, sparse coding, uh, etc. And all this algorithm is, ba is basically well connected to all of these. And in in our NIPS 2011, we uh, proved the connection. So, it's a little bit technical. So. Uh, I don't want to get into it uh, too much, but uh, if you're interested in how this algorithm, uh, what is the intuition behind this algorithm and how is it connected to all the algorithms, I'm happy to talk about it as well. Um, but um, as you can uh, view the, the RICA algorithm, which is a reconstruction independent component analysis algorithm as a um, neural network <laughs> where you have some, um, this is my data, is in a four dimensional uh, long vector. And all you need is just try, trying to lear, uh, learn the parameter co coded in the edge of the networks and to come up with a feature representation, which is the yellow bubbles. And then uh, people usually train it uh, one layer at a time. So they, they train one layer and then freeze that layer and train another layer on top. And then you keep going like that. So you can train so that you can grow the abstraction. So for example, they train the first layer to get edge detectors. 
And then they trained another layer to get uh, composition of edge, uh, edges so that you can have circles and corners and so on and so on and so forth. So you can grow it so that you can have very high level and abstract concept later on. And then once we're done with that, we could say, you know, take the features and give it to a, a classifier to uh, classify images. Um, so one, one interesting uh, phenomenon of this uh, Ricker algorithm is the, is the ability to, to learn features from a lot of modalities. So Ricker is actually very insensitive to modality uh, in the sense that as long as you have data in, in, term, in the form of a vector, you could give it to the algorithm, and the algorithm will be able to discover the, the right representation. So for example, if you want to do object recognition, then you work with static images. And you're, you have a, a static image like that, you're, maybe it's 10 by 10, so that your input dimension would be a 100 long vector. Your x is going to be a 100 long vector. Now, if, if you change your mind and you say, if you're interested in activity recognition, you want to work with videos instead, then what you could do is, r rather than giving the algorithm uh, one frame, you could give a sequence of frames. Then maybe I would say I will give the algorithm three frames. Right? So the representation that you give to the algorithm is basically uh, 10 by 10 by 3, and then you end up with an input dimension of 300. You just flatten it into a vector and give it to the algorithm. And then the algorithm will be able to discover the features that you want. So, um, the, so because of the, that, that uh, nice property of the algorithm, we use it for a lot of applications. So what I'm going to show next is uh, the, the, uh, a sequence of applications, that, uh, small applications that we have for, um, for, for Rika, and they seem to work very well. So we apply for images, and it works well. But um, all the applications that are non-conventional are things like activity recognition. So here, here are the task. So we want uh, to look at videos. Um, so for example, we have a lot of video, video like um, people performing action, walking, jogging, are running, uh, boxing, and so on. So these are in the form of videos. And our task is to, to try to classify these uh, videos. Right? And people have looked into this uh, problem for a long time. So, um, um, so, uh, the, the, um, the, so the algorithm that we use is basically uh, uh, sample patches from the video, learn the abstract representation using the Ricker algorithm. And then once we're done, we use uh, that representation to extract features for the video and then use it to classify the video. So simple stuff is easy. Right? And uh, so compu because computer vision people work on this area for many years, uh, it, uh, uh, people have started to show that, uh, people show that you know, it's harder and harder to get an improvement in all these data sets. So this data set is called the KTH data set. It's a very well-known benchmark in uh, computer vision. Um, and then um, when we apply our uh, learned um, uh, features, we're able to reduce the error rate in uh, probably half. So it's a very big improvement given that you know, people have spent uh, almost uh, 10 years or so working on this problem. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, we uh, apply the same principle to all the problems uh, that uh, in uh, on the problem in activity recognition and the improvement are also very massive. Um, uh, for example, in in YouTube data sets, so people have a set of YouTube videos and they want to classify whether um, uh, people do, are doing performing certain actions inside the video, and people have the idea of combining a lot of features, and by using just the learned features, we outperform all of them. Uh, the other problems that I'm also uh, looking into is uh, cancer classification. So a few years ago, about, about 10 years ago, I had uh, um, a, a family member that died from cancer. So I thought that you know, it's a very interesting goal to uh, have a machine to be able to detect uh, cancers from, um, from images, my M uh, MRI images, for example. So I have collaboration with friends and colleagues in uh, Berkeley, um, San Francisco, and Stanford trying to look at uh, MRI images, trying to classify, trying to say what kind of cancer that is and um, whether there are cancer in the cells. 
And uh, my friends actually work on this problem very hard. They, they wrote PhD thesis about uh, feature representation for digital man. So when I look at this problem, I had no hope to invent features. Right? I am not an expert in this area. But when I apply the representation learned by Rika to this problem, we're able to reduce the error rate also in half, which is a very, very significant impro improvement in the, that area. And, and my, my view about the, uh, the success is because, you know, it, in, in this application, it's it virtually we have no hope to actually invent good features. And it's actually machines that can do a better job in, this, um, in, in that space. So, so far I talked about uh, Rika is a very simple algorithm. It's an, an algorithm that trying to learn basis, reconstruct your data, and uh, the basis has to be sparse. Now, uh, and basically it learned from unlabeled data so that you can use a lot of unlabeled data to train the algorithm. Um, but uh, the next component of the talk gonna be uh, scaling it up, and this is a major uh, contribution. And a lot of people ask me why, why I need to scale up uh, Rika. It turns out that um, a lot of people, when they work with deep learning or Rika algorithm in particular, what they observe is that Rika is actually slow. And the reason is actually simple because we, learn, we tend to learn a lot more parameters than uh, other machine learning um, algorithms. And even machine learning is also slow. So what happened, well, what people do is that they take the real data and then they try to uh, downsample it somehow. So they're trying to make the images smaller or trying to the throw away uh, examples and so on. And then they end up with data, uh, something like that. And if, if you ask me, if you look at the images and if you ask you know, what, what, image, uh, what, what is there in the image, I, you know, it's very difficult to say. But if I look at the real data, then I say I can extract a lot of information from it, right? I can say that that's a picture of a human, but even more than that, I can in identify the human. I can say that that's a picture of Albert Einstein. So I think it's important to actually work on, on the real problem here, even though it's, it's quite hard. My work is inspired by a lot of research in a lot of other fields, for example, in NLPs or in uh, computer vision. So in NLP, there's this interesting work by Banco and Brio. Uh, Brio was in uh, Microsoft Redmond. Um, uh, so he, uh, what he uh, looking into, he said that, okay, so we want to um, understand how this uh, machine learning, uh, let's take all the state of the art machine learning systems and then try to understand these algorithms as I uh, change the number of examples, that increase the training set. So what happened is that as he increased uh, the training set, all algorithms, the performance of all algorithms seem to improve. So they get better, which is expected. Now, what is not expected is the fact that the order of the algorithm may change. So some things that work in a small scale may no longer work in a bigger scale. So maybe we're lucky that Rika actually is, because, is good because we work here, right? We work on small problems, so it works out very well. Whereas if in the future we have a lot of data, it doesn't work anymore. So that's one hypothesis, so it's possible, right? So I think it's important to actually, as a researcher, to look at, you know, push this axis as far as possible to understand the potential of all of these algorithms. Another interesting experiment is done by uh, my colleague at Stanford, Adam Coates. So uh, uh, in here, what he, he said is that, okay, let's uh, vary another axis. Uh, the another axis that we want to vary is the size of the representation, right? Uh, for example, instead of learning 64 bases, I want to learn 1,000 bases, or uh, 16,000 bases in this axis over here. And then I pick all the algorithms that I have, maybe k-means, um, autoencoders, whatever, all the algorithms that I know of, and then change the size of our representation. And what he observed is that as he changed the size of the representation, the performance on the test set actually it gets better too. So, um, so this advocates for the fact that you want to build a bigger model as well. So the two results, the Banco and Brio result and the Coates result say that you should try to push the number of examples uh, as much as possible and also push the, build a bigger model as big as possible. 
So how do, how, where do we start? Okay, so we have a rigor algorithm that seems to work for uh, small scale problems, but how, we, how can we scale a rig, a rigor to a bigger problem? So we have to make some certain approximation to actually scale it up. So the first thing that we, uh, we study a lot uh, about the property of Rika, but one thing that we notice is actually w applied, when we, when we apply Rika to a lot of domains, it turns out that Rika are actually learning, uh, is learning a lot of local features. What I mean by that is, for example, for images, uh, even though we learn uh, um, uh, lots of weights in here, what ha here I visualize the weights, like the parameter W, uh, one row of W is in one box in here. Uh, one row of W is one in one box. And even though uh, one, uh, you have a lot of connection, turns out at the point of convergence, you end up with a lot of zeros weights. And uh, the non-zero component group together, right? They don't, they're not everywhere. The non-zero component are not everywhere. They're in a small area of the image. So that's good. So what that, that, that means one thing we could do is we go back to the Rika algorithm, originally represented by a neural network, a two layer neural network that looked like this. And we could say, okay, instead of every um, uh, feature connected to every input uh, dimensions, we could relax that constraint and say, okay, all the, any feature should connect, be connected to a very small portion of the, uh, the data. Right? And then we can apply that principle everywhere in the network, such that uh, we could, um, we could uh, end up with a network that is sparse, uh, uh, connection, uh, with sparse connection, or in um, our language, it means locally connected networks, or locally, uh, local receptive field networks. And then once we have this local receptive field network, it's actually quite nice, because what we could do is we could distribute the computation across machines. So the features on the left side of the image, here and there, would be computed by machine number one, and the feature on the right side of the image here would be computed on, by machine number two, and et cetera. So we could take a model and divide up in, into 100 machines, and um, using 100 machines to scale up a model. Right? So that's quite good. And then uh, the way we train it is using stochastic gradient descent. Very simple, we take a model, we distribute it into 100 machines, and then you know, every, at every example, we're gonna go forward, we compute the gradient, and then uh, given the gradient, we make the, uh, the update to the parameters. So stochastic gradient descent, simple stuff. Now, so that's not fast enough though. Uh, so, um, so when we work it out on a, on a piece of paper, it turns out in order to train a job that we're gonna show you later, it's gonna take months or even a year. So it's gonna to be too slow to be practical. So we want to be uh, much faster. Now we want to use 10,000 machines to make it faster. But then it turns out that uh, when we use 10,000 uh, 10, machines, the probability of having one machine fail and so on is very high. And the chance that you know, you're gonna be waiting for one uh, slow machine is gonna be high with the previous system because everybody is waiting for everybody. Right? finally came up with a system that seemed to work very well. And here's how, how, uh, how it works. So the algorithm is called asynchronous uh, parallel stochastic gradient descent. So we take our um, uh, data and then divide it into uh, several uh, partitions. And then we train each uh, a copy of the RICA independently on each of the copy of the data. Right. So let's say we have three copy, we train three model of Rika independently, and then we're gonna make, keep them in sync somehow. And the way we keep them in sync is using a parameter server sitting in the middle. By a parameter server, I mean a few thousand machines sitting in the middle that waiting for uh, parameters to come in. And at every step, I'm gonna take, compute every copy of my model, I'm gonna compute my uh, gradient, and then the system will grab the gradient, make the update to the system, and then send back the new uh, parameters. So one thing here that I haven't told you yet is the fact that all the communications are actually asynchronous in the sense that at any time, anybody send delta W to the, uh, to the parameter server, the parameter server will grab the update, make the update right away, 
And even at time t plus one, somebody else will give the new, uh, new uh, delta w, which is computed on uh, the delay parameters, it still accept that update. So there's a lot of asynchronous going on. But the thing is that because uh, stochastic gradient descent is, uh, has a lot of noise, uh, having a little bit more noise in the delayed uh, doesn't hurt the algorithm. And it turns out this algorithm works, out, works very well and it uh, achieves very good um, uh, scalability. And uh, one nice property is that, let's say, if one copy of the model is uh, failing and slow, then uh, the rest of the system will keep updating itself uh, but um, but then, uh, um, uh, so the, the whole system will w work uh, on its own without that copy, and then when, once that copy uh, comes back up, he will contribute to the optimization. In particular, we can prove that this system, uh, in a convex setting, we can prove that this set, uh, system can converge to the same system using a synchronous update, and um, so that's very nice. So if the delay is not too bad, then it will converge to the same solution with a uh, synchronous so solution. Okay, so, so so far I talked about taking the model and then split it vertically and use 100 machines to, uh, to compute the features and then uh, divide the data to you know, several copies and then train with the parameter server. So that's two ideas that we can scale the learning system. So the third learning system, uh, the third idea that we had turned out to work also can contribute to this problem is the idea of uh, using very clever choice of learning rates. So when we train uh, stochastic gradient descent, there's one parameter in the system called the learning rate. So in the, if you set a learning rate very high, uh, what happens is at the beginning, everything converges very smoothly, but at the end, everything is noisy. And the reason is that if you make an update when the system is almost converging, you can change the system very a lot. So it's fluctuating, it's moving left and right and so on. So you may think, oh, okay, so let's lower the learning rate. And then you train it again, then what happens is you get uh, very smooth convergence, but then at the end, you don't get to the same solution that we had before, right? So that's not good. So we want to improve this. So the intuition is basically we want a, um, a, an annealing schedule that you have very large learning rate at the, uh, at the beginning, but very small learning rate at the end. So we have the trade-off between the two. And the, the way that we formulate it into a math mathematical problem is uh, very simple. So uh, imagine L of W is a loss function that we'll minimize uh, previously. We're gonna modify it such that we're gonna add um, another a component which is the damping between the solution at, uh, uh, to the previous step. So at every step, we're gonna damp our solution to the previous answer. And we're gonna pick lambda t such that the damping get higher and higher up, uh, after many iterations, right? And um, uh, I'm gonna show you the, 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 uh, the algorithm to pick lambda t, but the idea actually surrounding a concept in uh, uh, online learning called um, regret me optimization. So regret optimization means that you want, uh, every time you, you come up with an answer and there's an, a correct answer, and there's a gap between the, the, the answer that you have and the answer, that, the, 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 the true answer. So we want to accumulate, the regret means that the accumulated cost over the iterations. And a good learning system is trying to make the regret as small as possible. Right, so, uh, and here's the following um, theorem that we can prove. So let's say we can learn, um, pick a sequence of lambda, then there's a, an upper bound on the regret, um, uh, mathematically, that there's an upper bound on the regret that can, we can pick. Uh, the, the regret can be quite uh, technical, but the, the idea is basically, it's very difficult to pick, um, you know, uh, it's very difficult to pick big lambda or small lambda. There's two constants here that you should be worried, which is the bound on the size of W and the bound on uh, the size of the gradient. But other than that, it means it's very difficult to pick a good, a good lambda t. Uh, but the way that we pick a la good lambda t is, you know, uh, the idea is big at the beginning, small at the end. And um, 
if, you, we, if we believe in the, uh, in the bound, then what we could do is we could try to minimize the bound, right? We minimize, we get the bounds as small as possible so that we have as small uh, regret as possible. Like we play our games every time we lose, but we want the amount of loss as small as possible. So, you know, the, the bound is actually a quadratic function though. So it, you can minimize the bound and get an analytic answer. So every step, we're gonna compute the bound, estimate the bound, minimize it, and get a lambda t. So that's the idea, right? And uh, so this work is done uh, in our ICML paper 2009, but it turns out it makes a very strong contribution to the system that we have. Now, so we want to compare to the answer that we had before, and here's, here's uh, a comparison. So a large learning rate, you have uh, very fluctuation, small learning rate, uh, better, no fluctuation, but uh, doesn't converge to the same solution. So uh, we have a friend who is an expert in this area of picking the learning rate. So we ask him to actually sit there to tweak the learning rate. So at the beginning, he used a very big learning rate, and then if it starts fluctuating, he tweaks the learning rate so that it converges faster. Now, we use a system that we have, which is a proximal rate, and it, it does substantially faster than humans' experts. So that's quite cool. So we can actually cut the training time from several months now to may, maybe like a couple of days and like within a week using the three ideas that I had. So I worked with uh, Google folks um, more than two years on this project. So, um, uh, and we, we did a lot of, uh, in, in addition to the scientific questions that we asked before, we also make a lot of uh, uh, contribution in the system side as well. As well. So, uh, for example, uh, we, we, we built the system from scratch. We didn't, we didn't use MapReduce, and for the reason that MapReduce has a lot of uh, fault tolerance um, uh, uh, mechanism that we don't need, as I explained earlier. We also have a machinery to detect failure and discover, uh, discovery failure to actually restart uh, jobs and so on. And then we also use uh, single precision uh, in the system so that it's actually a lot cheaper to do communication and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of work uh, in this area, and I'm happy to talk about it if you, if you ca catch me after the, the presentation. So, okay, so here's a summary of the scaling up. So before I'm, I'm, I'm getting get into the results, here's a summary. So the summary is we, we used local co connectivity uh, to parallelize uh, one model, and then we used asynchronous uh, stochastic gradient descent to parallelize over the data set. And then we use a very clever choice of learning rate so that we don't need a human expert to tweak the learning rate. And it actually works better there. And also there's a lot of uh, system engineering uh, going on as well. Okay, so now uh, some experiments. So uh, I have friends at Stanford working on uh, very big computer vision problems, and I hang out with them and I ask them, you know, what are the biggest uh, computer vision problems that you work on? And my friend said, oh, I work on people detection, which is a very impressive problem. So, you know, I went to San Francisco, setting up cameras, capture pictures of people, go into San Jose, capture more pictures, and so on. I put together using mechan mechanical talk, and I arrived at 100,000 examples. So that's quite big, impressive. Um, but whenever I work on a problem, I really want to push that really far. And I want to be far in not one order of magnitude, but really two order of magnitude. And because the reason is that when we work at Google, we have no restriction in the amount of data. And the system that we train is gonna be, uh, you know, two orders of magnitude bigger in uh, the, uh, the size of the data set. Also two orders of magnitude bigger in the size of um, the model. And it turns out with this, uh, you know, big scale, things work out really well. Um, and I, I want to get to the, uh, the, the model a little bit. Okay, so the model we have is basically very simple. We train from images, we train uh, Rika, and then we freeze it and train another layer of Rika, and then train another layer of Rika. And the data set is basically sample from YouTube. So we write a process that every time we grab a frame from YouTube, just every iteration, it just grab a bunch of frames from, from YouTube <coughs> randomly. And then we train it on using uh, uh, about 2,000 machines that basically you have a few hundred machines sitting in the middle as a parameter server, and every copy is about 100 machines. So uh, we, and then we use about 14 copies uh, of, uh, the, of the models. 
And the model that we have, I want to emphasize, is that it's actually uh, 100 times bigger than anybody has tried. But if we compare with the visual cortex, that means uh, it's a million times smaller. Uh, so that, that's a very, uh, it's a number that we should keep in mind. But uh, so far, so good. The, the results seem encouraging enough. So here, here's, uh, so the, the whole system is trained unsupervised, right? It's just like looking for images on the web and then train itself. And we want to understand what it learns. So one thing that, uh, one analysis that we do is that for every neuron in the network, for every feature in the network, we give a lot of features, to, uh, a lot of images to it. And then we find out what images that excite the neuron the most. So imagine the, the output of the neuron is a function of the input. We want to find all the input that maximize the output of the neuron, right? And then we go, and, and at the top, we have about 100,000 features, and we're gonna have a visualization which is quite large that has 100,000 um, features, and every feature, when we click at it, we have, you know, 100 images that excite the neuron. And then, then you browse through these, these visualization. It's actually quite beautiful. You know, it, there are things that it learns, like a circle detector, for example, there's neurons that detect, you know, um, yellow flower on green background, and et cetera. So that's quite good. So one, one thing that actually strikes us really hard is the fact that it's actually able to learn the concept of faces. And uh, um, there, there's one, uh, when, when we browse through this uh, representation, there's one neuron that at the top, um, uh, the, the, the top images that it likes to see are all faces. So that's quite cool. And, um, and, the, uh, and the, the, the one thing, there's, there's actually there's one thing that is not, uh, that, that's not face, but most of uh, 99 out of 100 are, are faces, okay? Not all. Now, and uh, this surprises us, and uh, because uh, uh, a lot of the time, because this is a there's a very high representation uh, going on here. So a lot of people think that, you know, it's possible to hand code features like edge detectors and so on, which are very low level, but uh, understanding that there's a concept of face which is a very abstract and high level concept is actually quite hard. And uh, my thought was that it's not, not possible. So I, I was very surprised by this result. So uh, we did very careful analysis uh, to understand whether it's actually in fact a face. So we also do, uh, we perform optimization in the input space. So we run our local uh, uh, gradient descent on the input to find out what input excites the neurons the most and it turns out that it's also a face. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting because it's a concept that we thought that is not possible before. And then um, uh, there's another concept that the network uh, learns is actually the concept of uh, cat faces. And then, uh, um, then uh, there comes along the story of the New York Times about uh, the funny story about, you know, we, we have a lot of smart people, lots of machines, but all we can do is detecting cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I have a defense now because, you know, there's a the bigger story. Um, okay, so, um, so this, the visualization is, is, is amazing. So we, we browse through, we just see, like, you know, what kind of features that it learns. And you, you learn, you see a lot of these things. So you see circle detectors, you can see flower detectors, um, uh, you know, flower detector again, and birds on rivers, and et cetera. And then also, you know, high, very high level concept. For example, zebra, keyboards, you know, and then uh, you have uh, uh, wine bottles, and then uh, pizza, and so on. So, so a lot of these things are, are difficult in the sense that you don't have a very small English sentence to describe this concept. And imagine how I can come up with a sentence to describe pizza, for example. You know, it's a, it's a long sentence. So it's hard to actually encode it by hand, but the system is able to discover it. So that, that, that's quite uh, cool. Okay, now, um, so once I have the features, I want to do something uh, with it. So I want to uh, categorize images. So this is, uh, so I, I, ha I have friends at Stanford, Fifi, uh, Fifi Lee's gr uh, group at Stanford, uh, and then I asked them, you know, what are the biggest uh, problem, uh, challenging data set in computer vision? And they said, you know, either it's Pascal data set or ImageNet data set. So these are the two hardest data sets in computer vision. So I'm more interested in ImageNet um, because I think categorizing lots of categories is also a, an interesting problem. And um, I, I play around with this uh, for like a couple of days and I think this data set is uh, quite amazing. So they have um, 22,000 categories. 
So that is basically, you know, if you take a small dictionary, that means it, it's on the nouns in the dictionary. Oh, quite good. They have 14 million images, quite big. And uh, the, 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 big, the best system that work off for, for, these, um, uh, the, for this problem is actually uh, quite good. Uh, they require a lot of uh, handcrafted uh, and features and so on, like Sift and Hawk, and then spatial pyramid on top. So very clever stuff. So the, uh, I, I, I look at this data set and I thought, oh, wow, it's really hard. And um, uh, so for example, here I, I, um, I take a look at a small fraction of the categories in the data set, a very, very small. And the, here's a, some of the categories of fishes in the ocean. And then let's pick two categories, you know, stingray and manta ray. And then visualize the images and you can see uh, even I, I have a hard time telling the distinction between the two categories. You know, what, what are the images of stingray and manta ray, right? And, um, and uh, um, you know, I have friends in biology who, who could explain it to me, but I think at the beginning it's, uh, I have a hard time. And there's a lot of these things. It's really hard. I can show you some images later, but uh, I, I can tell that it's hard. Uh, so, so the system that we have is simple. All we do is we have a... Um, uh, um, a three-layer neural net that we have before, and we take the system that uh, we have and send it to, to a 20,000-way classifier. A lot of people do fancy stuff uh, on here, right? So they, they're trying to use the hierarchy and so on, but we said, no, we don't, we don't need that. We, we want to do just simple, basic stuff that everybody does. Right? So, and then we want to compare with the state of the art, which requires a lot of engineering. Okay, so because this data set has so many categories, and it's quite hard, um, a random guess would give you 0, 0 0.5%. Now, if you work hard, you get 4 or 5% or so. And then if you uh, work harder like uh, Western and Benjo, you get 10%. So before I tried this, uh, my, my solution to this problem, a lot of uh, senior people are very skeptical. And, uh, because the uh, and my friends didn't believe me. And uh, they said that, you know, you have no hope because a lot of the times, we use Sift and Hawk feature, and they're, they're the best thing in the world, right? And then we try our stuff, and we are actually able to double the performance that uh, they had before. Now, so that's quite good. But uh, people look at it and say, okay, 22%, it doesn't look very impressive. It's like, it sounds like, you know, at a rate uh, than uh, accuracy, right? Now, if, uh, because ImageNet has a hierarchy. Uh, it has, uh, you, you have to distinguish between manta rays, stingrays, and so on, and all these very fine grain categories. But if you're happy to go up one category, right, you just say fishes and, you know, uh, animals and so on, right, then you do very well. You could do better than 60%, right? And, uh, and um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite good. Um, encouraging. It's not human level performance uh, yet, but I think it's not very far. Um, um, okay, I actually um, I have a game of my, uh, I, I actually write a game because I'm curious of how this system makes mistakes and how this system, you know, able to predict the right answer and uh, what kind of mistake it makes to understand better. So I, I play a game where I make the prediction and the system makes prediction and so on and then compare. And then uh, the kind of error that the mistake makes, uh, uh, the, that the system um, make uh, kind of reasonable. For example, Sometimes it can't distinguish between, you know, Indian elephant and uh, uh, African elephant, for example. Things that are very similar have no chance. Um, you know, cassette player, tape player, only me, you know, with prior knowledge, I can tell, you know, the, the distinction and so on. My friends can't tell. Uh, the, you know, things like ma 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 malaria and uh, yellow fever have uh, very difficult, uh, uh, you know, people have very difficult chance to, to tell the difference. And uh, the, another type of errors that the system makes is actually uh, objects that are very small. For example, uh, here's uh, the label is Blanga, right? Uh, it's, it's that small object over there, right? And uh, here's the label is Snorkel, the object over there. And here's the label is Bear Skin, object over there. Okay, and here's the label, guess what? It's a ping pong ball. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, the system do does reasonable things. For example, you know, in this image, it, it actually classified as people. You know, not bad. Could be better. Uh, here it's a swimming pool person, swim trunk, and so on. And then it get to snorkel. But then, you know, reasonable mistake. People, trees, street, matching order, and etc. And then it will arrive at bare skin. You know, much later. 
could be improved, I guess. Ping pong ball, no hope, very far from it. So there, there's still a lot of work to be uh, to be done here. Okay, let's let's look at the, the kind of uh, uh, kind of the kind of uh, success that this system make, and it's actually very intriguing. Uh, in particular, here here's one um, uh, here's one uh, one image that I have difficult time to label, and the system get right and I got got wrong. So the system get um, uh, I got you know driver car etc. And the system understand that it is a seat belt. And the reason why it understands the seat belt on the high side is it because it actually understand that for in, in order to label image net well, you have to look very near the center of the image. But if you only see the center of the image, you have no hope to actually understand that it's actually a seat belt. You have to put everything in a global context to understand that actually a seat belt because it is uh, it's around a, a human, right? And then this, this layer image, I have no hope either. Uh, I, I label it a chair, but the system able to say that it's actually Boston Rocker. A lot of us don't know the label for it either, uh, and, uh, and so on. The system understand that this is an Acri uh, image, and, um, and that image is a, is a sh shredder. Another phenomenon is that uh, during training, we, don't have, we didn't have any uh, cartoon pictures. So we artificially look at the cartoon picture and remove them out of the training set, right? So at that time, because it worked so well, what I had said it was that, okay, let's fool the system by giving them cartoon pictures, which is never trained on. So let's see how it, uh, how it works, right? Cartoon pictures, different, somewhat, right? So, so when we look at it, and then we give this image and say what, what it learns, that's a face, understand that. That image, what is it? And that's a, it says that's an amusement and a, it's a park. Right, and uh, that's image. Uh, it says a uh, hammock, right, because of the, the shape. Okay, so so the system works very well, and it's actually doubling performance in a lot of um, a lot of things inside Google. And uh, I don't I don't want to talk too much about this, but it's actually for the first time, it's not embarrassing to work with uh, images. Uh, um, uh, and then. Um, uh, if uh, um, using the same idea that we uh, we had before, right? Uh, things like uh, Rika and so on, and parallel training, we also use it to train um, a speech recognition system. And now, if you use uh, an Android phone, then you perhaps working with uh, using this system already. So the voice search inside the Android phone is using the, some of the ideas in, in this talk. 